Welcome to our budget conversation for the financial year 2021-2022. With me is Ms. Damali Sali, who is the Acting Country Director of Treadmark East Africa, but also a trade development expert. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this conversation, Damali. I'll probably begin by asking you about the impact of COVID-19 on trade in the region. Well, uh, I think COVID-19 has had a great impact on uh, trade in East Africa generally. Uh, we could see at the beginning of 2020, around April, trade dipped a lot between East African countries, but also with uh, outside uh, countries with, with the outside. For example, Uganda, our average trade, our average exports to the world and intra-regional is around $400 million per quarter, or per, sorry, per month. But in April, it dipped to less than 200. In, That's in double. That, yeah, it, no, it, it, it halved. Uh, by half, it, yes. Yeah, yeah, half in April. And uh, that, that lasted until, because of course the supply chains were, were uh, disorganized, we couldn't import as much because of the lockdowns at that time. And we couldn't export either because, again, uh, the countries had lockdown in that time. But formal trade then, you know, came back. Around September, October, November, formal trade then came back up. We were still now averaging $400 million uh, per month. So, uh, in, in a way, East African economies have been very resilient in that aspect. So, yes, it dipped in April 2020, but by September, it had gone back up. What has been impacted immensely has been informal trade, because the borders were closed, and uh, these informal traders normally have uh, limited amounts of capital. So, even when they finally were opened up, they didn't have the money to start their trade again. So, that um, for Uganda, for example, each quarter we export about 44 million dollars worth of informal trade across the borders to our neighbors uh, but um, during April and that number hasn't gone back up it dropped to less than a um, million dollars and that number hasn't really gone back up yet because of this informal uh, trade but in terms of formal trade I think we, we've been very resilient as the East African community and the economies have come back up it, it, we've also begun to begin to, uh, to export more to each other to to the, our neighboring uh, countries and even more with each other because a lot of the supply chains that were disrupted, then we started importing from each other certain goods, which normally would have imported from outside. Some say COVID actually offered a new opportunity for other industries. Uh, for example, the manufacturers of uh, sanitizers, uh, and Uganda was quite uh, a beneficiary from that. Uh, the, 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 the countries, different countries approaching the COVID lockdowns differently. For example, Uganda, leaving the borders open and allowing for trade to continue as one of the reasons we, we didn't see uh, uh, you know, a sustained dip, but a, a dip and then growth of, of the sector. Does that speak to some of the data you're seeing in terms of different countries approaching, uh, uh, taking up different interventions for COVID? Yes, I think, and I think you're gonna do uh, pretty well because as you, I remember, uh, the, the government took the view that we will not trade is an essential good and therefore we will continue to uh, for uh, uh, goods to flow. You could see even at one point where the local communities in Uganda were uh, quite concerned about the trans potential of COVID yes. from say, Kenya into yes. Uganda then yes. because we are a transit route. Uh, but the government still stuck to its guns and said, no, we are a transit route, we are also a destination. Trade will continue and trade continue to flow. And uh, that approach, I think, was also taken generally by the East African community. So I, I remember the Ministry of Health of Kenya, Uganda and, uh, and Rwanda and Tanzania, uh, sorry, and South Sudan coming together to discuss so what do we do about these truck drivers who we have to test in Kenya when they come to Uganda we test them we go to South Sudan we test them can we not find an approach where the test the, the Kenyan test COVID test for this truck driver can be accepted by Uganda and then accepted by South Sudan so you could see a lot of uh, coordination in East Africa around how do we deal with the COVID issue so that we stay resilient and it has helped us I think actually as, as a community to stay resilient in that in that so one of the advantages COVID brought on the table, which I think are not many, um, when you look at the impact of COVID on, on the entire economy, and since we're talking about budgets, um, was that the region probably decided to work closer to, because if, if you had a country like Kenya and Tanzania and, and Uganda, um, they discovered they needed to, to trade more with themselves than trade um, externally because of you know the lockdowns across the world, especially Europe, and the fact that it was difficult to do business with certain countries outside of Africa or outside of your regions. And so you had countries like Uganda strategically benefiting from the lockdowns and, and the lack of manufacturing in some of the countries uh, they were 
importing from, say in China or even in, in, in Europe. And so our industry, like our diary, our, our sugar industry, and, and, and those were some of the first winners uh, for Uganda with COVID. But then, you know, you then saw uh, much later when the economy started opening up and China started open their industries again, that then that became a, another problem for our industry because they, they had the option to go back to the, those industries. Was, was this good for the industry? And, you know, in looking at the data with cross-border trade, was this something that you actually captured? Yeah, I think it was quite eminent. Uh, interestingly, Uganda, we have a trade surplus. We've always had a trade surplus in terms of intra-regional trade. So we export as a country, we export more to our neighbors than we import from them. So out of that $400 million per month pre-COVID of exports, general exports, around 60 or 70% of it is actually intra-regional, it's to our neighbors. And we're usually exporting cement, uh, plastics, beverages, those are the manufactured products. But then we're also uh, exporting the maize, the sorghum, the millet, the grain, and we're exporting a lot to our neighbors. And yes, indeed, when uh, we, the, the, the lockdowns happened, our, our manufacturers actually exported even more to our neighbors because then they couldn't import from China. DRC could no longer import from China during the deep lockdown, the stuff like the straws or the plastic. So it was now importing more from Uganda. So we did, we did benefit in that particular aspect. And I'm hoping that, of course, we can continue with that. If you look at our Uganda's biggest export, coffee. Uh, we export about $500 million worth of coffee each year, but 90% of it is actually the coffee bean. We have an added value to it. We are exporting this thing that we've grown for, you know, for years. Our farmer would have grown it on their land, and then we export the bean without adding value to it. So in that aspect, you're going to probably need to do a whole lot more on adding value on this product, because if we added value, say, on the coffee that we're exporting, that $500 million per annum could actually quadruple. Because you, would, you also have to look at the jobs that we would create. You have to look at the byproducts that come out of coffee. Uh, you could do um, uh, what fertilizer from coffee. Uh, it's, 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 it's an input into the pharmaceutical industry. It's an, it's an input into the beauty industry. So many things can actually be done out of coffee. And to do so, we need to therefore start adding value a lot to our products, especially those things that we're exporting the most. I target coffee because it's one of the biggest exports we have and it's just the bean. And if we added more value to them, we could actually sell a whole lot more and get more value out of it. And most especially if you think about now the Africa continental free trade area, imagine how many African countries are actually importing instant coffee. Very many. We are exporting the raw bean and then all the other African countries are importing instant coffee. If we added value to our coffee here and then targeted the African market, of every African country that's importing this instant coffee, we sell it. We sell them our Ugandan coffee. That would actually increase our economy greatly. If you look at what we are doing with the oil, where we're saying no, we will do a refinery in Uganda so that we keep the the byproducts, the petrochemicals. It, that's what we're supposed to do with the coffee, really. We've had coffee for over 50 years. We haven't done that. We're doing that for the oil. We should look at coffee as the other item that we have to deal with because we have now two of the most traded items in the world: coffee and oil. But we're treating them differently. I don't understand why, but we should look at coffee as a major product that we should add value to. But uh, in addition to that, if you look at um, some of the issues that have been coming up in the ESC, the trade barriers, uh, non-tariff barriers and technical barriers to trade, if you look at uh, Kenya, uh, our diary, chicken, sugar, maize most recently, has been stopped from accessing the, uh, the Kenyan market, uh, citing standards. Uh, South Sudan, uh, okay, the issues are to do with our traders or truck drivers, they were killed several instances they've been killed in South Sudan. So, of course, Ugandans can't you know, easily now trade with South Sudan. Then with the DRC, the barriers there are physical infrastructure. There's just barely any infrastructure in DRC. So that's a huge market. It's our second biggest export market, but it's second biggest when, with all those impediments of poor infrastructure. So if infrastructure is done with the DRC, that would be a huge opportunity for us, actually, as Uganda to trade with. Then Tanzania, we've been having issues with them on sugar. So you can see in the ESC, there's been a lot of, and then Rwanda, of course, Ugandan goods can't go to Rwanda for the last two years. You, if it's a Ugandan product, you just can't access the Rwanda market. So we've been having a lot of issues in the ESC. Even though we've been trading with each other, there are a lot of issues that have been happening in the ESC over the last one year, especially around barriers to trade against each other. We're stopping each other from trading as much as we could. Uh, the ESC, though, is the most integrated block on the African continent. But we still see these issues uh, coming up. And I feel like, as governments, governments have to work more on bilateral engagements. 
to resolve these issues on a bilateral. Uh, I, I, I was reading um, an article, I think two days ago, where the WTO cited the East African community as the, the community that has reported the most NTVs to the WTO. We account for 26% of all NTVs reported to the WTO, which are about 3,000. Of it, 36% are coming from East African countries. And that to me, on one hand, it's good that we, we are transparent and open and actually acknowledging when you know uh, each another country imposes an NTV. But on the other hand, it also shows you how much of an opportunity we are not using because we are stopping each other from you know actually trading freely. If you look, intra-African trade starts at around 15%. So African countries are trading with each other just 15% of the total trade that they export to the world. We need to open up and trade with each other a whole lot more because the first market the first market you access gives you the biggest profit as long as the distance is shorter so if if i sell my matoke from kampala to drc i get a bigger profit margin than if i decided to export it to the uk that profit would be much smaller so it makes more sense for a manufacturer for um, a farmer to sell directly to the immediate market than trying to go without you get a bigger profit margin and i feel that's the way we, we need to look we need to target I, 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 from what you're saying, I, I, I pick what some of the things the budget will be speaking to this financial year, the next financial year, and I'm seeing areas where Treadmark has consistently been uh, trying to support government uh, around the issues of digitization, um, which would probably answer some of the concerns of the NTBs, standardization, of you spoken about value addition, and um, our the ease of doing business um, you know with each other at the borders with you know the one border store points um, is this enough you know in your view uh, certification and all these things are this enough for us to actually then do much more business with each other you know from the 15 percent we're currently doing as a, as, as a region to say even 50 percent if we just went to 50 percent and opened up a little more uh, but even as you think and want to wish for that there is still homework to be done at home. And we are saying, can we improve our certification? That digitization process of our products. Um, how do you access markets better? It's by creating platforms where we can, you know, the, 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 the farmer can post their produce, the market can then pick their produce and tell that this value of cassava is available in this area. And then the other person who is interested, the buyer is able to find it and then link uh, and reduce the middleman. Is, is that a conversation you're leading? Uh, it's a conversation thing we've been having with, uh, with uh, working with the key government agencies on that. If you look at the work we've been doing with the Uganda Revenue Authority on the Uganda Electronic Single Window, it was to make sure that we have the trade agencies on one system so that the, 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 the trader doesn't have to move from UNBS goes to URA, then go, you go to MAIF, and you're working with a piece of paper. That's what was, what was happening before. And you could see the Uganda Electronic Single Window was actually uh, picked up as one of those interventions that helped a lot during COVID. You remember during the deep lockdown when nothing could move but trade, and you couldn't move around, the clearing agents couldn't actually physically move around. They used the system to do that, and that was uh, an indicator of where we need to go. And COVID has shown that actually we need to use electronic systems that's just the way you know the world is going uh even on the african continent uh the african continent of free trade areas look at digitization as one of the key components that are going to be looked at then the other thing about physical access uh, that's important still the physical access is important if you look at the drc where now we are uh, doing the Antaroko lake port uh, to access the drc plus goli mahadib once a border post is because when as soon as you get to the ugandan border the road stops and and therefore, our traders can't access easily. Even the, 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 the DRC people, it's, it's harder for them to come to our border, pick the goods and then go back. So that has to, the physical access also has to help because the goods also, even if you've cleared them electronically, they have to physically go to this destination. So that has to also work. But then also our internal logistics, that is key because Uganda, we are a distribution hub. We are surrounded by potential markets. I still call them potential markets because we haven't yet fully, fully exploited that potential potential markets, but you have to access them. But to do so, you can't just open up at your borders. You also have to have your internal logistics working. If you look at what is currently happening is that uh, a lot of goods come from Mombasa, they come to Kampala, all of them, because the warehouses are in Kampala. It doesn't matter that these goods eventually are going to end up in Juba. They actually come to Kampala first. Even when they're going to uh, DRC, going through Arua, which is the top end, they still come to Kampala. That's very inefficient, because then everything is stuck in Kampala when it could have been going up. 
So that's why we are now looking at the Gulu Logistics Hub to look at to to, to uh, act as a distribution center to service South Sudan and the DRC and eventually even the Central African Republic. Because also what we, we when our study showed that uh, a truck will come from Mombasa with goods, come to Kampala, maybe go to Gulu, then Juba, and then it will come back empty and drive through Uganda, empty. And yet you could pick up stuff in Uganda, but it's just so inefficient. Our logistics is so inefficient that a 20 foot container cannot stop at every little market to pick up maize. Maize which doesn't have a, a certificate of origin, it doesn't have the quality mark. It can't do that. So that truck is not picking up maize, not because it doesn't want to, but because it's just, there's just no process to do it. So the Google Logistics Hub is supposed to target those trucks that are coming, go to Juba full, come back drive through Uganda empty, to stop at Google for one hour. Uh, they load up with maize, 20 foot, a 20 foot container of maize within an hour, they get a certificate of origin, and then they get the quality mark, and then they drive out. And that way we will be increasing our exports. But the internal logistics has to work. If, if you don't have efficient internal logistics, you also can't work. So even if we are a distribution hub right now, we are not fully tapping into that. The fact that so many trucks are going to Uganda, to DRC, to, to South Sudan, to Rwanda, and then they, they are all having to travel through. We could have used that to actually export a lot of our stuff, but it has to be consolidated and it has to be done in a way that is actually efficient to do. And those are the areas I think we, we need to work on, we need to tap into, but then also a lot has to work also on the value addition. Because uh, if, if I look at the budget currently, the, the, the budget speech that uh, Matia Kasaija gave out at the beginning of the month, he said uh, the two opportunity areas that he sees are exports to other African markets, but the second one is the oil sector. And he mentioned how there will be uh, about uh, 15,000 jobs, direct jobs, 45,000 indirect jobs, 105,000 induced jobs in this sector, which is going to happen over the next four years. But all of this is going to bring in a lot of cargo to come through. That pipeline is going to be constructed using stuff. It has to come through. We have to make our logistics efficient. The refinery is the same thing. A lot of stuff is going to come through, but it has to make our logistics efficient. But then also touching on standards. If you look at standards, the logistics industry, the food industry has been earmarked, ring fenced for Ugandans. But the caveat that most people don't talk about is it's ring fenced as long as they're qualified Ugandans to do it. So yes, our maize may be ring fenced that yeah, anyone in the oil sector has to buy Ugandan maize. That's the law. But if the Uganda maize doesn't meet the standard, that company has a right to go outside. So we have to be able to meet those standards. Uh, if you look even trucks, um, you'll find that the oil companies that are going to do the refinery, they'll require qualified truck drivers to actually bring in their, their, these, these equipment. It's very high value equipment. They need someone with a, with a certificate. They actually need certificates. Ugandans, very few of our truck drivers actually have those certificates. So even if this job is ring-fenced for Ugandans, Ugandans won't be able to tap into it because we don't have the requirements. Because it's ring-fenced as long as they're qualified Ugandans to do it. So we need to look at standards. We need to look at the sectors where there's going to be growth. Uh, the oil sector, there's going to be growth. And then we need to look at what do Ugandans require to actually access those ring-fenced uh, areas. Uh, if you even look at uh, agriculture, the same thing. We need to add value so that we can export more of our things to the, to the next market. I saw uh, there's a gentleman called Nkandu, he's in coffee. New Cafe? Is it New Cafe? New he, was, he was giving a presentation where he was talking about how much the farmer actually received, the Ugandan farmer received of the, of the, of the, of the coffee. It's less than 1%. So we need to make sure we add value so that our farmer receives a whole lot more. Otherwise, soon we'll have people who are not interested in farming anymore. All right. Uh, Gamali, let's talk to the... Let's begin in the East African region. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's been efforts you know, even in government, to preach to uh, promoting regional trade. And this next budget, just as you mentioned, Matia Kaseja will be providing incentives to promoting trade in the region, meaning uh, maybe uh, value addition to some of the products that we're already trading in the region, uh, the issue of quality uh, and, and putting in place other quality controls, um, but also working with you and other partners in trying to make it easier for our goods to move from you know the the market or, or the farm and to the market wherever the market is whether it's in drc nairobi uh, or even in dar es salaam and um as, as trademark and of course as a, as a trade development expert do you see us doing enough um, to be able to to build the competences in in in, in benefiting from this regional trade 
at the East African level? I think we could do more. Um, uh, I see almost uh, each, every, every budget here, trade is talked about as one of those very important sectors and as something that uh, the government is very interested in. And there is a lot of talk around it. But if you look at the eventual budget that goes, say, to the Ministry of Trade, which usually is an indicator, which goes to the Ministry of Trade, it's not that much. And yet the things, the barriers to trade that I've mentioned are, yes, physical, but a lot of them are non-tariff barriers. But, so you know, there has to be a lot of bilateral Kasenja will say yeah. that whatever the budget he provides, say, for infrastructure, which is for, for the roads and energy, and whatever he provides for, say, ICT, which is, you know, in supporting infrastructure for ICT, is actually going to uh, trade indirectly. Uh, yeah, indirectly. And uh, let me give you an example. So, yeah, we have wonderful uh, uh, cross-border trade infrastructure with Kenya. We do. And we have systems. Our systems are actually integrated with Kenya. But when someone comes up and says your maze doesn't meet the standard, it doesn't matter that your infrastructure is fantastic and your systems are integrated. That's what they've said. And what unlocks that? It's their engagement, the bilateral engagements with the technical teams that have to actually engage and talk to each other. Because currently, uh, I've talked about how much we are reporting, uh, the ESC is reporting to the WTO, but that's just a report. It's not a resolution. So the resolution is on the engagement. So there has to be those discussions. We need to have sufficiently technical people who can actually sufficiently deal with the technical people in the other country who can then engage on the dialogue. Yes, definitely infrastructure. I mean, I think in his speech right now, he said uh, five trillion Uganda shillings actually going to infrastructure, and he's targeting the the pipeline and then the meter gauge. Uh, I think okay, coming from Kenya to Uganda into DRC, which is great because it's going to be moving huge amounts of cargo. But all these things are oiled by conversations. They're oiled by policy. So there is those soft aspects that has to also be paid attention to, and uh, so. The Ministry of Trade, of course, being paid attention to means our technical people, government technical people, have to be the ones to do that because it's the government that actually uh, dictates policy, dictates those discussions. So a lot of a lot of emphasis also has to be put on the bilateral discussions. Infrastructure def definitely helps. Without it, of course, you can't even move. Uh, if you look at DRC, we can't export to them because we don't have a lot of infrastructure there. So that's important. But there are different pieces that should be given equal, okay, not equal amounts, but equal emphasis. All right. So let's talk about the, the, the you know, the, the continent itself. And, uh, you know, I, I see the budget will be speaking to, uh, you know, working with uh, the, the continent on the Africa uh, common market free, uh, free trade area. And uh, I wanted to ask, um, have we as East Africans positioned ourselves, first of all, to begin benefiting from um, the free trade area? I, I would say probably not yet. And it was uh, obviously affected by COVID. Because there was a lot of momentum around the uh, Africa continental free trade area when we, uh, a lot of countries ratified it. And it was supposed to begin, I think, when 2020, February, January 2020. And then COVID happened and everything stopped. All the meetings that were supposed to be had were, well, couldn't be had because at that point every, everyone was locked down. So that slowed down the momentum quite a bit. One of the first things actually that was supposed to be discussed were tariffs. African countries have higher tariffs against each other's products than they do of a Chinese product. So again, because of the bilateral relations they have with the different exactly, countries, in Europe and in China. Yeah, yeah, but those bilateral relations have to be oiled by these conversations, bilateral discussions with the countries so that those tariffs are reduced. Just if tariffs are just reduced or eliminated by 90%, uh, the study done by the CFTA is that if we reduce tariffs against each other, African countries against each other by just 90%, we would double our trade with each other we would more than triple jobs on the African continent. So those tariffs have to be reduced. But what, what is going to lead those to those tariffs being reduced? There has to be discussions, there has to be negotiations. Those negotiations were affected by COVID because then the Secretariat in Ghana couldn't actually hold those meetings. Uh, as the Afri East African community, they had come up actually where the East African community, Sadak and Komesa, had this trilateral block, which is a third of the continent. And they were going to start the negotiations from there. Because the East African community, we have one, one common external tariff. So we can negotiate with Comesa on that as a block. And uh, that was supposed to move things faster, but it has been affected. And unfortunately, I haven't yet seen that momentum around the continental free trade area pick up again. But that is also due to the fact that the East African community, somehow our momentum also slowed down over the last, I think, two and a half years. 
the East African community hasn't had as much uh, passion and push for trade as it did before. I'm, I'm a bit optimistic because I'm seeing that push come back again. Uh, I, I saw when uh, the swearing in of the president, we had almost all the presidents surrounding Uganda come to Uganda. They've now begun uh, discussions, even Kenya, the meter gauge discussions started, you know, when the swearing in happened. Kenya and Uganda discussing the meter gauge. Then uh, Tanzania, uh, with a new president, a lady, uh, these has begun to begun to open up quite a lot. You've seen her actually engage with Uganda, engage with uh, Kenya. So I'm seeing a and new... And most recently the, 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 the bilateral deals with DRC. With the bilateral deals with DRC, yes. exactly. So and DRC, they're trying to bring the DRC onto the East African community. So I'm seeing a new optimism in the East African community because also it's ESC being the most integrated broker on the African continent actually has to lead a lot of these discussions because we are seen as you know, the most advanced because we're the most integrated. So whenever there's a, I feel like whenever there's shocks or um, slowdowns in the East African community, the African continental future area is definitely affected. So I'm optimistic because I can see now a little bit uh, yeah. like yeah. momentum over yeah. the last month uh, yeah. pick up. All right, uh, time has run out. Um, if I give you a minute and, and you're able to say direct us to what are the priority areas government should be focusing on uh, to benefit from, first of all, not just the continental free trade area, but also regional business and regional trade um, here in East Africa? I think we need to focus on standards, quality standards, uh, to support the private sector to be able to meet those standards. And uh, government has a lot to do in that. Uh, SMEs, our SMEs have to be supported to be able to meet the minimum requirements so that those uh, markets uh, can be accessed. Because standard is one of the key reasons why our products, you know, we have those barriers, is standards. Then we also need to look a little bit, I haven't seen the details of the budget, but we need to look at water transport. Water transport is one of the cheapest forms of transport. If you look at the Lake Victoria Basin, it's an economy in itself, but we're not utilizing it because the water transport is very inefficient. Uganda, we have a lot of lakes actually, that we can ease movement if we improve water transport. That's really, really key. And then we need to uh, also work harder at engaging, having bilateral engagements with our neighbors, because that is where our comparative advantage is. We have a trade surplus in intra regional trade. So we need to focus our energies in that. Thank you. Thank you, Damali. I've been speaking to Ms. Damali Sali, the acting country director of Treadmark East Africa, but also a trade development expert on uh, trade in the region, trade on the continent, and uh, how we can actually improve our trade relations with our neighbors and on the continent. Uh...